Well, I am so glad that you are here this morning for part two of our current sermon series called, What Does It Say? There's a lot of things we could have named this sermon series, but if you look at your handout, point out just a couple of things. Our key verse, once again, if you look at it in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 on your inside flap, this is the, this is the key verse, our memory verse. This is the one that children are learning, so I'd encourage you to learn it along with them. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for, and it lists four things, doctrine, reproof, correction, and for instruction in righteousness. We went over those four items last week, and the question that I basically left you off with last week was simply this. Would you have the courage, if the Lord reveals his truth to you in his word, would you have the courage to believe it? Pretty basic, right? You say, well, Pastor Ken, what if my family doesn't believe it? That's something you have to wrestle with. What if what I was taught isn't the same as what's in there? I don't know. That's something you have to think through. My, my question for you is, it's real. like I said last week, it really comes down to a matter of authority. Is it what somebody else says? Or is it what the Bible says? Uh, if I can use the illustration of the video you sent me. Uh, Bonnie sent me a video this week. And I'm sure you guys see this stuff all over the place on Facebook. And I'm sure it's from people that mean well. And I'm sure it's from people that love the Lord. There's a video circulating around, and I had seen it before. You said I rewatched it so that I could remember. But there's so many things like this on Facebook. There's a man that says that he died and he went to hell for 23 minutes. And now he's touring around, written a book, and telling everybody what it's like because the Lord uniquely used him. And he said, Pat Robertson was interviewing him and said, Why do you think the Lord chose you to do this? The guy said, I asked God that same question, and he told me it's so that I could come back and tell everybody how literal it is. So, you know, as I look at that and I compare it to the Word of God, I look into the eyes of this man who's sharing this story, and I think to myself, is he a sincere guy? I don't know, but I'm just going to assume, sure, let's just say he's sincere. What do we do with a sincere person in a suit and tie that has the Bible in their lap, that's speaking a truth that sounds like it's biblical, but it's not matching up with scripture. What do we do with that? Do we just kind of say, well, maybe it's just true for him. What do you do with that? Are we able to take the teaching of God's word and to look at something that's emotionally, maybe kind of looks like it should be true and say, you know what? It's just not true. Can we say those words? Can we say that's not true based on Bible? I think that we can, and I think we have an obligation to. It doesn't mean we're hate-filled. I always ask this question a lot when I get into debates. I say, is it possible to disagree with somebody without hating them? Is that even possible? Of course it is. <coughs> hate doesn't necessarily equal disagreement, or disagreement equal hate. So the question this morning, as I asked you last week, is this. Do you believe the Bible to be authoritative in your life? Even if it's different than what you thought it said. Let's go this morning. I want to have this very, very simple part two. We're going to learn about the body, the spirit, and the soul. You say, Pastor, I'm pretty sure I know what my body is. Well, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. <coughs> your body was made of dirt. So if you have a very high view of yourself this morning, just remember this. You are animated dirt this morning, okay? You say, I don't know. That's not very uplifting. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. But the Bible also says you are fear fearlessly and wonderfully made, fearfully and wonderfully made, so that means that somebody loves you enough to organize your dirt in a really beautiful way. So there's purpose for your life. You're not just dirt. You're dirt with a purpose. We're going to look at this verse right here <coughs> before we dive in. We have a very, very, very simple morning this morning. And I'm not trying to pull a fast one on you, but I'm just going to tell you this. If you follow along this morning, the implications of this morning... I guarantee you are bigger than you even imagine because we're going to build on this morning. And the next thing is logical in order. This morning is not hard, but I want you to understand if you miss the foundation of this morning, the next week will be a too big of a jump for you to follow. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you. So just know that although this is simple, it's profoundly important to your faith. Okay. You just have to trust me on that. Genesis 2, 7 says this. This is the history of you. This is how you became to be. The Bible says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 
There's three important parts to this verse. I'm going to underline them here so we're all on the same page. First of all, you were made of the dust of the ground. That's your body. Very simple, right? Everybody who, even people who are unsaved can get along with that. From dust you're made, how, what's the proof of that? From dust you'll return, right? This isn't difficult. That's what you are made from. And when the absence of life is there, it's what you'll return back to. The second part is the Bible says God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. That's spirit. That's spirit. You say, what is my spirit? It's breath. In fact, in almost every language in the world, the word breath is the same as the word spirit is the same as the word wind. Every language in the world, those are all three interchangeable. And in fact, next week we're going to look at a play on words on these in John chapter 3 when Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus. And he says, how do I get born again? He says, well, answer me this. Where does the wind come from? And Nicodemus doesn't know. And he said, just like that. So we're going to go into this word wind. Every single thing that's animated in the world is animated by wind. Wind is the solar, is the power source. It's the power source for the entire world. Nothing works without wind. If you consider that thought for a second, you'll see how powerful that is. In fact, we learn in the Bible that the Spirit of God moves over the face of the deep. When there's nothing there and God is creating, what is the animated force behind the world? It's spirit. It's wind. It's breath. So you say, what is my spirit? See, the reason this is such an important Sunday for you, and, and I wish we had all of our, our normal people here this morning, regulars here, I wish it was packed because this morning is so important. So you're blessed to be here this morning. Because we're going to teach you something this morning. What is your spirit? Because if you'll notice, if you're like me, the words soul and spirit are kind of, you know, you've been taught they're kind of interchangeable. They're not. And you've been taught they're, they're kind of abstract and we're not really sure. They are very defined. And this morning we're going to take all of that confusion out. So you're formed of the dust to the ground. That's your body. God breathed into you. That's your spirit by the spirit of God. Think of this as the word wind or breath. And based on these two things happening, I, I want to read it very carefully. Man became a living soul. Notice, it does not say you received a soul. Do you see that? The, 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 the very simple thing here this morning is that you have a body. You have wind. So body plus breath equals soul. Do you see that? Am I making anything up there? It says you became a living soul. God could have very easily said, and then you received a living soul. It doesn't say that, does it? It says that body plus breath equals soul. So this is the very simple equation. You say, pastor, this is so easy. Why are we taking our time? I'm taking our time because do you realize that what we're going over this morning almost made the reformation not happen? You say, really? These three simple words? Are you kidding me? Yes. What I'm telling you to you right now, Martin Luther believed what I'm telling you right now, but John Calvin didn't. John Calvin was a big mouth. Martin Luther was much more reserved and an intellectual. Martin Luther understood the importance of the Reformation to happen. He understood the importance of breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church to have freedom of religion. And so he saw this as a minor point of doctrine that didn't have to do with salvation. So Martin Luther became very quiet in this, although he believed it if you read his writings. John Calvin became a huge big mouth on this issue. And he believed that you received a soul, not that you became a soul. And so if you look at different things uh, like the, the second Helvetica, which is a confession in the, in the that a group came together and created a, a confession in the 1500s that has this idea that you just received a soul that's always been alive and always will be alive. Do you see now the implications are getting bigger, aren't they? Based on that confession, we had something called the London Baptist Confession in 17, 1679. The London Baptist Confession was with the very beginning formations of a Protestant movement that branched off that became, um, uh, became known as the Puritans. The Puritans are what branched off and became like the Baptist Church. And, and a big movement that, that's from that wing. So this is a very important confession. It's called the London Baptist Confession of 1679. They took largely from the confession I just told you about, the second Helvetica. I know we're going deep, but it's important. And they said, body plus breath equals, uh, you receive a soul. And what I'm saying this morning is, let's look at once again. I'm, I, we're going we're gonna to go over this because it's just, you are not going to believe the doctrines we're going to talk about next week and the week after based on this. If you miss this, 
then you are actually missing such a vital point. Do you realize if you miss this this morning, you won't even know how you're made up and you'll actually believe in pagan doctrine. You say, Pastor, how could that be that important? Because if it says that body plus breath equals you just receive a soul, then you become God. You say, are you serious? Absolutely. Because if you're like me, you kind of think of your soul and your spirit as interchangeable. They're not. But if you were like the way that I grew up, and I kind of thought that way, you know how I got my doctrine? I got my doctrine from It's a Wonderful Life. Ever seen It's a Wonderful Life? Remember at the very beginning, when the, 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 the angels are talking, and remember when Jimmy Stewart's character is kind of, and they show them as what? Like blinking, kind of blinking stars in the sky, and they're talking to each other. And that's just kind of, is that my spirit? Is that my soul? And you ask people, you say, what's going to happen at the resurrection of the dead? And they say these words, I guess my soul is reunited with my body. Really? Your soul can live outside your body? Well, if you believe that body plus breath equals you just receive a soul, now soul becomes a thing. Do you see that? It's like a thing you can put in your pocket. It becomes a separate entity. But if you take what it says, then you don't get that. You see, let me say it very, very clearly this morning. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. Let's work through this. So, very simply, body plus breath equals soul. So if this arithmetic is correct, do you agree that I got this from Genesis 2-7? Am I okay so far? What if I take one of these away? What if I just have body? Because body plus breath equals soul. If the word soul just means living being, what happens if I take breath away? What if I take your spirit away? What do I have? I have a dead soul. You say, are you sure? We're going to play a game. This is the game. Uh oh, where's my very important slide here? All right, I don't know where that is, but we're, I'm going to say it verbally. Look at your handout. I have it in there, and then we'll look up at the... Oh, here it is. I do have it. We're going to play a game. That's still not it. Hang on one second. This is too important. I'm going to go back. All right, I don't have it in there. Okay, go ahead and look at your handout if you would. We're going to play a quick game. We're going to play two games this morning. The first game we're going to play is going to be called the Nefesh game. Hey! Yay, game time. All right, Nefesh game. What's the Nefesh? Well, Nefesh, if you look in your Strong's Concordance or any concordance in the world, you're going to find out that the word Nefesh is the Hebrew word. So you're going to learn two, two Hebrew words this morning. You say, Pastor, why is it important that we know Hebrew? Because I'm sure everybody understands, and if not, I'll say it again for you. The Bible that you hold in your hands, if you're holding an English Bible, I imagine you probably are, it wasn't originally written in English. Now, I believe that you can hold your English Bible and get everything that you need to get. Please understand that. I'm not saying this morning that you can't understand things if you're not in English. Wasn't Genesis 2-7 easy to understand? But we're going to reaffirm that by going in so I can show you how I'm doing this. The Hebrew word that we get in Genesis 2-7 that says man became a living soul, the word soul is the Hebrew word nefesh. And we're going to play a game. I'm going to go to different verses, and I want you to show me on the screen, where is the word nephesh? So that's our game. Where's the word nephesh? Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. You say, pastor, I do not see the word soul in there. It's not, but the word nephesh is in there. So here's the game. Where do you think the word nephesh is in the Bible? All right, life, good job. This is the same word in Genesis 2, 7 that we read as nephesh, and man became a living nephesh. Same word. All right, let's try again. That very next verse, Genesis 1, 21. And God created great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Where's the word nephesh? Hey, you guys are pretty good at this. So you mean to tell, oh, it isn't in there? Stop, put your hand out. Oh, I didn't know it was in there. Okay, uh, but you know what? If you, if you, but if you were to look at that and I were to say, where's the word soul up here? You'd say, it's not there. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Do you realize what we just did? See, I believe the majority of my life that what made man unique was because I had a soul. How many of you were taught that? I was. What makes me different from the animals is that I have a soul. 
wait a second, I don't have a soul. I am a soul. And man became a living soul. What does the word soul mean? Living being. And God created great whales. Are you telling me great whales have a soul? No, I'm telling you great whales are a soul. Different, right? Different. And also every living creature that moveth. You mean little, little Farfy is a soul? Yeah. Yeah, Sparky's a soul. Why? Because, think about it. This is not hard. Body, does your little dog have a body? Yep. Plus breath, does Arfie breathe? Yeah. So body plus breath equals living thing. Living creature. Right? I'll tell you this. The only reason why this is hard this morning is just because of what we've been taught. This is not difficult. If you didn't know anything else and came here this morning, you'd look, look at this and go, got it, move on. But the reason why I'm going to have to show you 50 different ways is because we've been taught a different way. Right, you agree? Remember the name of the series? What does it say? Are, is it fair that that's what we're doing? Living creature. So God created great whales and every living creature that moveth. He created great whales and every living soul. He created great whales and every living nephesh. He created every living nephesh. Different, right? I can see some skeptical faces. Here we go. Genesis 1, 24. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind. <coughs> Cattle and creeping things, beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Where's our word nephesh? Creature. Genesis 1, 30. <coughs> to every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. And to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me. And it was so. Where's the word nephesh? Well, mixed reviews there. Any, any, any thoughts? Life. Very good. So, every, so what it's saying is, and to every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air, to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is nephesh. Do you see that? It's referring back to what you say. What, what, what is a soul according to scripture? Everything that creeps upon the earth. You see, if it's animated, it was animated by the wind of God. Remember what I said? And the spirit of God, spirit, wind, breath, interchangeable. The spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. So you say, what gives us energy? <coughs> what animates us? What makes you different from the dirt outside? Because you were made from that. You know what makes you different from the dirt outside? Wind, breath. It gives you the energy. And if when you have body plus breath, you, be, you make a created being, a living creature. Exact same word as soul. You see, really, our hang-up is not the word nephesh. Our hang-up really isn't even the word creature. Our hang-up is not the word life. Our hang-up is the word soul. Isn't it? Because every time you hear that, you think it's a wonderful life, womp, womp, womp. And you've heard your whole life, man, when you die, your soul's going somewhere. And you've created your soul to be a thing you can put in your pocket. Because the pagan belief system is that man can't die. The Bible says hundreds of times you can die. You say, I don't know. Hey, what does it say, right? What does it say? Let's do it again. Genesis 9.4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Where is the word soul? Where's the word nephesh? Very good. You would never catch that if you're just doing a casual reading, would you? That's the word nephesh. And go home and check all these out. You have them in your handout this morning. But flesh with the nephesh thereof, I could properly read that, but flesh with the soul thereof. Exact same word. Which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Let's go on. Next verse, Genesis 9, 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast. Will I require it at the hand of man and at the hand of every man's brother? Will I require the life of the man? Now, I'll give you a hint. There are two words that equal soul or nephesh in this verse. Lives and life. Very good. Lives and life are the two words. And surely your blood of your nephesh. Doesn't that make a little bit more sense? When David is praying for the Lord to heal his soul, 
He's not praying for God to heal some imaginary entity he can put in his pocket. He's saying, hey, my body is sick and my... I'll tell you this. I, I, have, I have got some sort of a cold thing. You'll probably hear a little bit of my voice. And uh, I tried to exercise yesterday just because I knew today was coming. Like, I got to get out and walk. I've been in my bed for a little while. I'm like, I just feel terrible. You know what the biggest thing is I can say right now? I can't catch my breath. I go out and walk and I'm like, Whew. and I'm talking like I just left the house and brought our garbage cans into the side of the house. And I was like, Whew. and I, and I was studying this while I was doing, it. I thought, man, isn't that amazing? I don't feel well and I can't catch my breath. Isn't that amazing? You know what every single person on the planet dies of? I went to EMT school and did firefighting for a while. You know what everybody dies of? Everyone has the exact same cause of death. Oh, there might be different faces of it. But you know what everybody dies of? Lack of oxygen to the brain. That's why you die. When you cut off oxygen to your brain, you're going to die. It might come in a lot of different forms. But ultimately, you think about it, that is actually why people die. When you don't have any more oxygen to the brain. That's why you can hold your breath for a while. And what was it? David Blaine held his breath for like 12 or 13 minutes or something crazy. What's that? Allegedly, yeah. Uh, there have a few conspiracy guys out there. Chris, where did the moon land? I, or where did we land? Anyway, um, Hollywood platform 17. Um, I, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, allegedly, but people can hold their breath for a long time. Does that mean that he was dead? No. Why? Because he still had oxygen circulating in his blood and he was training his mind to be able to do that. But ultimately, everybody dies from lack of oxygen to the brain. So surely you're, the blood of your nephesh will I require. Let's go on. Verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cow. By, by the way, do you notice? Do you notice what we're doing this morning? We are so far off talking about people. And I want you to see that. You say, I thought that I had a soul. No, you are a soul. Can I say it this way? You're a living being. Isn't that easier? Because you have a body, don't you? And you're breathing. Therefore, you're alive. You're a living creature. That's not hard, is it? Okay, so with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl of the air, the cattle, every beast that is of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark, and every beast of the earth. Now, where's the word nephesh in there? Close. It modifies it, but you're on the right track. Living creature. It's the word creature. Something that's moving, <coughs> but you're absolutely on the right. Okay, we're going to play our second game. Our second game this morning is called the... Neshama game. Yay. Nefesh went over pretty well. You guys did fantastic. This is called the Neshama game. Now, where are we getting the word Neshama from? It is also from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It means breath, spirit, every breathing thing. You say, Pastor, are you making these things up? No, that is from the Strong's Concordance, talking about the Hebrew word. The word Neshama. Let's look at it again in our context. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, which is your body, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath. Of life. That word breath is the word neshama. He breathed into you the neshama of life, which is how we get this very simple equation, which you've seen now a couple times. Body plus breath equals soul. Can I say it this way now that you know Hebrew? Body plus neshama equals nefesh. Yeah, now you know some Hebrew. Here we go. Let's look at this word neshama, which means breath. It means spirit. It means every breathing thing. We're going to look at these things. All right, Joshua 11, 11. And they smote all the souls wherein there, uh, where therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not uh, left to breathe, and he burnt Hazar with fire. Now, I want, I, want you to, I want you to notice something from this verse. Now, we kind of already concluded our soul portion of our game. But I want you to see something. According to your understanding of the word soul, can I kill your soul with a sword? What does it say, right? Can I kill your soul with a sword? Now, we've been taught you can't. You've heard it your whole life. But what does it say? That's the name of the series. Remember what I asked at the very beginning. If God reveals something to you, would you believe it? If God has something in his word, will you change your viewpoint and believe him? What does Joshua 11, 11 say? They smote all the souls. Wait a second. You can't, you can kill a soul with a sword. Yeah. You know why? Because it means living creature. Can I kill you with a sword? Yes. Why? Because I can take your breath from you. Make more sense? But look what it says. Now, where's the word neshama in here? 
wherein that with the edge of the sword utterly destroying them. Did you send them to heaven? No, you utterly destroyed them. And it says, there was not anything left to breathe, and he burnt Hazar with fire. Where is the word neshama? Good job. Soul was nephesh. <coughs> and they smote all the souls, nephesh, with there with the uh, edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not left any to neshama, to breathe. This is the same word when the Bible says, Genesis 2-7, and God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Same word. So we see that it's not a, it's not, I'm, not, I'm not taking anything out of context. We're not cherry picking here throughout the entire Bible. Breath can be used as spirit. Spirit can be used as wind and all of it animates life every single time. This is not cherry picking. I'm showing you a huge amount of scriptures. And by the way, I am eliminating hundreds that we could go over. Second Samuel twenty two sixteen, the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were discovered. At the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. Interesting. Look at what it says. Did you know that the seas appeared by something? Did you know that our Lord can make seas appear? Did you know that he can make foundations appear? Have anybody watching the volcano uh, activity in Hawaii? Unbelievable. I heard on the way over here this morning that my, my brother is actually planning on going there um, this coming week. So, whew, I don't know. But he's got a friend on the big island that lives there that's giving him updates, but I'm like worried for them. But uh, he's got 14 people going over. That, I'm going to hide in his luggage or something. But anyway, um, but this volcano, volcano they're talking about that could explode this big one. I heard on the way over here that there could be rocks the size of a refrigerator that will be shot out of the volcano two miles in the air. That is some force. I couldn't even believe that. They said, they said, we believe there's going to be rocks shot out of the volcano. And I'm like, oh, I'm thinking, you know, they're like, sizes of refrigerators. I'm like, that's not a rock, that's a boulder. The size of a refrigerator, too. You know the force it would take to shoot a refrigerator, a solid rock the size of a refrigerator, two miles in the air, and they said it will exceed speeds of over 200 miles per hour to do that. Can you imagine seeing a refrigerator-sized rock going two miles in the air, about 200 miles an hour. You say, well, there are some incredible things with, look what it says, the channels of the sea. Consider seeing the Panama Canal. Consider all of the things that you can see on a globe. The, the channels of the sea just appeared when our Lord went. Whoosh. Look what it says, the channels of the sea appeared and the foundations of the world were discovered. They were there the whole time, but he let them be seen. How did this happen? It was at the rebuking of the Lord when he said something, and it was at the blast of the neshama, the breath of the Lord of his nostrils. This is the exact same breath, neshama, the great same Hebrew word as in Genesis chapter 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and neshama in his nostrils, the breath of life. It is, the, it is the animated power of God. He finds something that is made of dirt and he neshamas out of his mouth and animates it. It's the breath of God. It is the word spirit. It is the word wind. It is the word breath. Absolutely interchangeable and 100% throughout the entire Bible. Job chapter 4 verse 9. By the blast of God they perish. And by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. Now, where do you think the word neshama is at in this? Breath. By the blast of God, they perish. And by the breath of his nostrils, they are consumed. We see not only is the power of God in animating things through neshama, we actually see here the judgment of God is done through neshama as well. By the, by the, by the voice of God, by the wind of God, by the breath of God. If you remember in your Bibles in the battle of Armageddon, the Lord Jesus himself is going to stand up one day and divide the nations as a shepherd sh separates the sheep from the goats. And when he does that one day, the Bible says that out of his mouth will come a sword and his sword will come out of his mouth. Now, what is that talking about? Well, this is called a sword. The Bible's referring to this thing as a double-edged sword. Man, this, this, this Bible is so powerful that it can, it, can, man, it can set you free from the bondage of sin. And it can, also, it can also judge those that don't believe in the Lord himself and condemn them away from life itself. It's a two-edged sword. It means it can do one thing really powerful, but there's another edge to it. 
It can do something else really powerful too, and they have opposite meanings. And so one day when the Lord Jesus stands in the battle of Armageddon, the Bible says that a sword will come out of his mouth. And when a sword comes out of his mouth, the Bible says he'll begin to judge the nations. Now, what comes out of your mouth? Isn't it your word? Isn't it your words that come out of your mouth? And how do you form your words? With your breath. That's the exact same reasoning that the sword comes out of his mouth. Why? Because another word for sword is the word of God. It's inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration. And so Jesus, out of his mouth comes a sword we call the word. It comes out of his mouth and he begins to judge the nations. And so it says, by the blast of God, by the breath of God, by the, by the, by the movement of the wind of his mouth, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. It's not only an animating force, it's also the very force that's used to judge the world as well. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, consider this. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Now we're still in our game. Where is the word neshama? Very good. This is the first time that we've seen it used as spirit. We've been looking at it used as breath. We notice in Genesis 2, 7, it's, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. I told you it's interchangeable between wind, spirit, and breath. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 27, the neshama of man. So now we're going back to Genesis 2, 7, and God breathed into you breath. So your animated force from dirt is wind. Is this fair? This is fair, right? God breathed into you wind to animate dirt. And he says, that dirt that's in you, it's like a candle of the Lord. What does it do? It's searching all the inward parts of the belly. Man, where does your wind go to? It goes deep inside you, doesn't it? When I went through EMT school, I, I, I'm so thankful for it, although I ultimately didn't end up becoming a firefighter full time. I'm so thankful for it because I can use all of those those tools and talents to be able to take care of my family with medical stuff in a very small way, you know, just general stuff. <laughs> for a firefighter, basically, we just, what we always say, we just kind of bundle and, and send it off, you know, if there's not a lot of doctor stuff going on, but just general stuff. So to be able to put a stethoscope up to your lungs, I, I, I learn how to be able to hear what I'm hearing for and on the back. And what you're listening for is you're listening for any kind of a, a, a irregularity or a crackling sound for your lungs. As wind is going in, if your bronchioles have a, a probably how mine sound right now, if your bronchioles have some kind of a virus in there, I can hear that through listening through it with a stethoscope. I can hear that as the wind is coming in. I can hear it being blocked. And if you go deep inside of your lungs, which is basically a, a, a sac that your body, body is amazing that keeps the sac, it can hold air inside of it. And, and if you want to get really technical this morning, how amazing it is that you're breathing right now. Your lungs have a sticky substance on the outside of them and they're connected to your thorax or they're connected to your chest cavity. And you have something inside of you that's called a diaphragm. And when your diaphragm, which is below that, begins to go up, you exhale. And it pushes it out. <sighs> think of it. Let's, let's just hurt our minds for a second. Let's just think for a second. When you breathe in, how do you breathe in? I know you're like, I've never thought of this before. Do you breathe in because there's muscles in your throat? Do you go, I'm going to breathe in now. And do you, do you tense your throat muscles to breathe in? Think about it. You feel it through your throat, but how do you breathe in? You breathe in from your diaphragm moving. And when your diaphragm contracts and goes down, it creates negative pressure and it sucks in air from outside and you feel it streaming through your throat. So really you're breathing right now from your diaphragm going up and down. Your diaphragm's way down here. Interesting. And so as I exhale, I'm relaxing it and it pushes it out. That's why if we push on someone's stomach, uh, lets their air out because you're relaxing that diaphragm and for me to breathe in, I have to contract my diaphragm and it creates negative vacuum pressure inside of me and it sucks air in. You say, why is that important? Look what it says. It says, the nefesh of man, or the fact that you are animated with wind, is the candle of the Lord. You know how he's able to see in you? You know how he is able to inspect who you are as a person? It's only possible because he's breathed in you. You take your nef you take your uh, neshama out, and there's no breath in you, guess what? There's also no candle to look inside of you. You know why? Because you're dirt. This isn't hard, is it? It's just different. This should be a, an exciting Bible study for you this morning. The neshama of man, 
your breath, the fact that you're breathing, is the candle of the Lord. And this is what he does. He's searching all of the inward parts of the belly. Look at this in Ecclesiastes 2.7. If you've tuned me out, please tune back in. <coughs> this is vitally important. This is probably one of the clearest verses in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 12.7 says this. This is referring to death, if you want to take the time to look at Ecclesiastes 12. Referring to death, the Bible says, Then shall the dust return to the earth. Very clear, right? We understand this. I've done lots of funerals. When you go to a funeral, you know what's going to happen to that body that's no longer animated? It will, in time, decompose and turn back to dust. This isn't difficult. So this is going to return back to the dust of the earth. How, how, in what form? As it was. See, I think that when we get a misunderstanding of this teaching, we over-spiritualize the Bible and we sound kind of crazy. <laughs> There's so much I want to tell you, but i got to save it for next week because I'm going to bleed over on my topics. You don't want to miss next week, okay? Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. Nothing hard here. But look at this. And the neshama, I gave it away. The neshama, you better get this one shall return unto God who gave it. Now look at what it says. If neshama is the word spirit, do you understand this morning as your pastor how much I could confuse you if I wanted to with this verse? Why? Because when you walked in this morning, you probably thought your spirit and your soul were sort of interchangeable and they're kind of separate entities. You know what I could show you? Your body's going to die, but you, you go to God when you die. But now you know more, don't you? Because what does it say? It says that this is what? It's your breath. It's your wind. Doesn't it? Am I making this up? Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. That's your body, not hard. You say, well, what happens to my breath? When I breathe my last, what happens to my breath? Well, it says right there. Your breath, your neshama, your spirit. What does it do? It returns back to God who gave it. It's important to him. It says in the book of Proverbs that the wind is in his treasuries. Think about that. The Spirit of God moved over the face of the deep in the book of Genesis. We all are familiar with this. When the book of Genesis was writing about creation itself, it says it was, it was void. And then what happened? The Spirit of God moved in. What does that mean? The animated power of God animated everything. That's why when we have an animal, it's called an animal. You were animated. That's what the word animal is based off of. It was a pile of dirt and then it became animated. Think about when Walt Disney first started doing Steamboat Willie and stuff like that, right? It was drawing on a piece of paper, but he moved the paper fast enough and it appeared to move, and we call that animated. That's the exact same thing that God did to us, is when he breathed into us, he made us to move. He made us animated. And so it says that when you die, the dust will return to the earth, but your breath, the same thing as in Genesis 2-7, that God breathes into you the breath of life. How hard is this? Your breath returns to God. Does anybody want to take a guess as to why? Because one day, you're like, I'm not saying anything. Because one day, when Jesus returns for you, you're going to be alive again. You know what's going to animate you? The breath of God. See, breath is valuable. It doesn't just go away. He receives it back. Now that you know all of this, let's begin thinking through some things that you already know. Acts chapter 7, Stephen is getting stoned. He says, Lord, to you I commit, commit my... Good job. What did he mean by that? I'm about to stop breathing in a second. And God, only you hold the keys of resurrection. What did Jesus say when he was on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The Bible says he looked up and said, it is finished. He said to the Father, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my... Exactly. Is this hard? Simple. Now let's get to a, a more familiar outline. We're almost through this morning. If you would turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Let's just look over something this morning. We'll be through. We're almost done. Hebrews 11. And by the way, let me just say this. I love you guys this morning, and I want you to go with me on this journey. I want you to get this. Having said that, if you struggle with anything that I'm sharing this morning, I know that it's new in some cases for you. Maybe some of you have already heard this. There are a lot of people that believe this, that we've kind of been hidden from because of how the Reformation happened. I can explain that in detail another time. But here's something I want to offer to you. If you're hearing this information and you're confused by it or you have sincere questions, please, please let me know. 
I will not be offended if you challenge what I'm saying. Hey, if I'm wrong in what I'm saying, you should challenge it. Amen? The authority this morning is the word of God, not me. So please let me know if you have a question about it. I will humbly answer your questions to the best of my knowledge. And we'll go down this journey together. This is not um, something that I want you just to take because I'm saying it. But please go down this path with me. All right. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. And uh, I'm sorry, it's Hebrews 4.11. My fault. Hebrews 4.11. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. The Bible says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. So the Bible here is saying that it's going to be some hard work while we're still alive. While my body has breath in it, I'm going to work hard. Verse number 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, speaking of the Lord of the Sabbath, or where we go after we die when the Lord calls us home and we're resurrected, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So the Bible is, is likening the idea of unbelief and resting prematurely. Those two ideas are connected together in the Bible. <coughs> that those who have no belief rest now. You know people that try to find their rest now and all they want to do is rest now? The Bible's like, no. There will be a time for rest and the Lord will give us rest. But now's not the time to be lazy. Be lazy, man, when you're in the kingdom of God. Be, be, be rested then when all of the work is done. But we, don't, we can't afford that now is what verse 11 is saying. So here's your life application on this verse. It's just simply saying, now is the time to use my body to work hard for the Lord. You see that? Very simple. Verse 12. And here's why I wanted to bring you to this passage today. For the word of God is quick. So the word of God, the, the Bible that you hold in your hand this morning... The word quick here means to be able to reanimate. The word quick here means to be able to make alive, which is in fact what we read in Genesis 2-7, that God takes dirt and makes it alive. Consider the story of Moses before the burning bush. Remember the story? Moses is standing before the burning bush, and the bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed. And Moses is like, what is going on with this weird bush? And he's thinking to himself, I have been out here way too long by myself. I'm seeing bushes on fire that aren't being consumed. And Moses is like, what is the deal with this burning bush that's not being consumed? And all of a sudden, the bush starts talking to him. I'm like, Moses, you're low on liquids or something. This isn't right. The bush starts to speak to Moses. And what does the Lord say? He says, he says take off your shoes. Why? Think about it. For the place that you're standing is holy ground. And Moses takes his shoes off. Think about what the Lord is saying there. One minute ago, he could have been standing there, and that ground wouldn't have been holy. The word holy means set apart for a purpose, specifically for God's purpose. But now <coughs> that the fire was there, the voice in the bush said, take off your shoes for where you stand is holy ground. If one minute ago it wasn't holy and now it is holy, what made the difference? The presence of God changed regular ground to now set apart ground used for his purpose. His presence made the difference. It was normal dirt and now it's very, very special dirt used for a specific purpose. And you're the same way. <clears throat> you were ordinary dirt when God formed Adam. But he made a replicating molecule in there called your DNA. Now this very special dirt, he breathed into and animated it, and here we are. And now you have to have breath to be alive. And when you don't have breath, you aren't alive. <clears throat> and the Bible says in verse 12 that the word of God is that quickening agent. The Word of God is the thing that takes ordinary things and makes them inordinary. It makes them extraordinary. We say, I want to live an extraordinary life. <coughs> Get in this book. It'll make you extraordinary. It'll take a regular life and make it extraordinary. Verse 12, it says, For the Word of God is quick, it's powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And look at some things that the Bible can decipher between. You say, Pastor, how come... I don't hear men talking about this, this topic very much. How come the Bible has the ability to be able to tell the difference between these things? Look in verse number 12. The word of God is quick, it's powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It says, piercing even, even to the dividing asunder. So the Bible can separate things. And I'm hoping this morning that it did this for you. 
The Bible is so powerful that it can make a division this morning in your mind. I have always heard that soul and spirit is interchangeable. What does the word of God clarify and separate? The Bible says it is the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Unbelievable. You know what can help you know the difference between soul and spirit? The word of God. Are they interchangeable? Not according to about 50 verses we read today. What does that? It's the word of God. What else does it separate? It separates the joint and the marrow of the bone and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Did you know you have thoughts that don't become intent? Isn't that a crazy idea? There are thoughts that come into your head. I ought to kill that person. Do you intend to? I hope not, right? Let's hope it stops the thought. I ought to just slap that person. You'd be in jail if you didn't have a difference between thoughts and intent. We'll stop there. Life out, I was going to go into something about Jeffrey Dahmer, but I better not. Verse 12. The word is powerful and is, this is our life application. The word of God is powerful, amen? It just is. It's powerful and it is what will be used at the day of judgment. God will bring his word out. The Bible says a book is open, another book, and the law is there, and the, life, the Lamb's book of the law, uh, Lamb's book of life. What will be used at the day of judgment? Here's the good news this morning. The good news is this, that God made a way for me to survive that day and have everlasting life. Amen. Isn't that important? That's an important part of the story. You say, well, I'm kind of nervous about all this talk about body and breath. Hey, listen, don't be nervous. The one that put the breath into your body, he wants you to live forever. And he gave you the ability to do that. And the Bible says the thing that can help you to understand that is his word. I read an interesting verse this week. Let's see if I can find off the top of my head that I can end with this. Romans, I believe, chapter 3. Verse number 4. Please think of this as we go through this topic, Romans 3, verse 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Is that a powerful verse? Here's the question this morning. You know what the question is this morning? What does it say? Do you notice I didn't put on the front of your bulletin, I didn't put, where did you go to college? You notice I didn't put on the front of the bulletin, what do your parents believe? You notice I didn't put on the front of the bulletin, what is the majority of what believers believe? I didn't put on the front of the bulletin, what are you most comfortable believing? I almost named this series something and God changed my heart because I think it was bad. I almost named this series, why, why was I taught that? I almost named it that. But you know what? That puts the emphasis on our teachers. And you know what the reality is? It doesn't matter. This is the most important question of the day. Here's the most important. What does it say? Do you agree? Do you find that to be the truth this morning? It's really a question about authority. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 4, Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. Do you know how we're justified before God? In his sayings. Wouldn't it be silly for us to depend upon the sayings of God to be justified before him and gain eternal life? Wouldn't it be silly to, to depend on him to be justified and ignore him in how we're made and what we are? That doesn't make sense. And so in verse number four, it says that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when? When thou art judged. So everything that we're talking about today is very important. We talked about something very, very simple today, but it might be hard to believe. Body plus breath equals soul. Can I say it a different way? When a body has wind put into it or breath put into it, it becomes a living being. Not difficult. I am praying, I am praying that you stay with me in this series. I guarantee you today will have the least amount of impact. Because next week and following will radically change maybe some things you were taught. But I make this pledge to you, it will be biblical. To the best of my ability, it will be biblical. You see, the implications of today are massive. And next week we're going to talk about this topic. Is a soul immortal? Is a soul immortal? Based on what you learned today, you could already answer that, couldn't you? In fact, we read it out of God's word in Joshua 11, 11, and many, were, many souls were killed by the sword. Did you know almost every person on the planet believes that a soul is incapable of dying? They believe that a soul lives forever. 
I used to teach that for 15 years, and it would go something like this. At this time, I invite you to come forward at the end of our service if God is speaking to your heart. You've heard this before. My friend, let me, hear you, let me tell you something this morning. If you were to die today, do you know where you would go? Because I'm telling you right now, the Bible says that if you were to die today, you're going to spend eternity somewhere, even he either heaven or hell. How many of you heard that verbatim about your whole life? I said it on staff for 15 years. I finally listened to what I was saying. You say, Pastor, how did you discover this? Why is this so different for you? You want to know the reason? Because I wanted to be the best teacher that I could possibly be. And I wanted to prove that you're in the presence of God. I wanted to prove all of these things and be the best teacher that I could be. And as I looked into it for myself and put down commentaries and put down what everybody was saying and I read it, I went, you've got to be kidding me. Not only could I not find it, it was the exact opposite of what I thought. So I come before you with this very simple question. What does it say? See, that's different than what I was taught. Well, you need to wrestle with that. For me, this is what I've discovered in my life. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I want to know what God says. I believe with all my heart that this is the inspired word of God and it's preserved for me. I believe that. If that's true, the only question is, what does it say?